Welcome to British History, Royals, Rebels, and Romantics. I'm Carol Ann Lloyd. You can find me at carolannlloyd.com or at at shakeuphistory on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Please follow me so we can explore history together. I'm delighted you're joining me for a January 2021 podcast series, Your Questions Answered. As I've heard wonderful questions from so many of you, I thought it would be great to have some time to discuss them. And keep those questions coming. What we don't get to in January, we'll address later in the year. Thank you so much for starting your year by joining me in a journey back in time. We'll continue to shake up history, to explore lesser known facts and figures, and to look at the people who don't always make the history books. Mostly, we'll continue to see how history shows us what's possible. After all, the stories of the past inform the present and inspire the future. And now, let's jump into your questions. Imagine the moment in 1553. King Edward VI is dying. He has spent his reign dedicated to the cause of religious reform. The efforts have been dramatic and wrenching for many in the country. New laws that wiped out religious practices and celebrations that have shaped the life of England for hundreds of years. Churches broken up and precious artwork and stained glass windows destroyed. People's families torn apart by different responses to mandated religious practices. But for Edward and those closest to him, the efforts have brought England closer to the truth and closer to God himself. Their efforts mean nothing less than the salvation of the country. Now all that is hanging by a thread. Next in line to the throne is Edward's half-sister, Mary. A devoted Catholic, Mary has actively refused all of Edward's efforts to convince her to conform to the new religion. She has maintained her Catholic beliefs, even under pressure and repeated threats. As queen, Mary will have the power to undo everything Edward has done. So, is there anything Edward can do to prevent Mary returning the nation to Catholicism and, in his mind, sending everyone to hell. Could anyone else succeed him? Surely there was a fine Protestant male in the family somewhere. Mm, maybe not. The succession. The traditional laws of primogenitor, respected and generally followed through history, had already been interrupted by Edward's father, Henry VIII. Henry VIII's greatest desire was to leave a string of male heirs to ensure the lasting strength of the Tudor dynasty. Instead, he left a young son and a host of female relatives. Through a series of marriages and succession acts, Henry had taken Mary out of the line of succession and made Elizabeth his heir, then removed Elizabeth and declared he had the right to choose his successor, and finally put both of his daughters back in the line of succession. Determined to control the future, even from the grave, Henry had laid out additional plans for the future of the dynasty in his will. Edward, of course, would succeed him. After the death of Edward and his heirs, or if Edward didn't have any heirs, the throne would pass to his daughter Mary and her heirs, and then to Elizabeth and her heirs. If Henry's children died childless, the crown would traditionally go to the heirs of his eldest sister, Margaret. That would have put Mary, Queen of Scots, on the English throne. Instead, Henry chose to disregard Margaret's descendants. It was a bold move that demonstrated Henry's belief in his own powers. This was his lesson his son learned well. Henry VIII turned to his younger sister Mary's family, naming her descendants as heirs. It was a surprising move that Henry bypassed his niece, Frances. Why? In the 16th century, it would be assumed that, if a woman inherited the throne, her husband would take the role of king. Henry didn't trust Francis's husband, Henry Gray, and that makes sense that he would not want Henry Gray on the throne. So, he went right to Francis's three daughters, Jane, Catherine, and Mary. Finally, if none of Francis's heirs had children, the crown would pass to Mary's youngest daughter, Eleanor, and her daughter, Margaret Clifford. After that, he said, the crown would go to the, quote, next right heirs. And those fine Protestant males Edward was looking for? Not a one. 
Edward was left with nine female possibilities, if we include the line of Margaret Tudor. His half-sister Mary, Henry's named successor, and his half-sister Elizabeth. Then the granddaughter of Margaret Tudor, Mary Stuart, and Margaret's daughter, Margaret Douglas. The three daughters of Francis Brandon Gray, who were Jane, Elizabeth, and Mary, and the daughter of Eleanor Brandon Clifford, Margaret. The Council John Dudley was a skilled fighter and politician who worked his way up to the top of Edward VI's government. Originally, he supported the Duke of Somerset as Lord Protector, but by 1550 he was positioning himself for the top job. After Somerset was executed in 1551, Dudley was elevated to Duke of Northumberland and became president of the King's Council. He worked closely with Edward to run the government and push the cause of religious reform. Northumberland's influence over the king continued to grow. When Edward became dangerously ill in 1553, it was natural for him to turn to Northumberland for advice. The two men were committed to preventing Mary Tudor from coming to the throne. They had found someone else. Lady Jane Grey The exact date of Jane Grey's birth is unknown. Scholars place it anywhere from late 1536 to well into 1537. She and her sisters received a good education. Jane was a dedicated student and made remarkable progress in her studies. John Aylmer was her tutor and encouraged Jane's interest in religious reform. Jane's enthusiasm for learning and religion was an important foundation for her. In 1547, Jane entered the household of Thomas Seymour and Catherine Parr. Catherine had been an excellent stepmother to the royal children, and now she welcomed Jane, as well as Princess Elizabeth, into her household. Catherine's household promoted learning and the new Reformed religion. Jane and Elizabeth shared intellectual and religious interests, and both young women flourished in the care and mentoring of Catherine Parr. Jane was devastated when Catherine Parr died in September 1548 after giving birth to a daughter. Jane was chief mourner at Catherine Parr's funeral. She was happy to see the funeral was performed in English and according to the rites of the Reformed death. After Catherine Parr's death, Jane returned to her parents. In November 1549, the entire Gray family went to Tilty Abbey to celebrate Christmas. Mary Tudor was then at Bilieu and invited the Grays to visit. According to Fox's Acts and Monuments, Jane saw one of Mary's ladies curtsy to a painting of the Virgin Mary. Jane questioned and criticized the woman's actions. The brash words displayed a lack of the diplomacy so essential in navigating religious differences at the time. Mary heard about Jane's outburst and was offended. Even though Fox is known for exaggerating his stories, this reaction of Jane's is in keeping with her devotion to her views of religion and her determination she was right. The King's Death Which brings us to that pivotal moment in 1553. As the King's illness progressed, Northumberland knew he had to act quickly. Edward moved to Greenwich in April. His his symptoms were getting worse. Northumberland sent reports to Mary and Elizabeth, claiming the king would recover, but he would not allow them to visit the king. Northumberland arranged for his son, Guilford, to marry Jane Grey. King Edward supported the marriage, ordering his master of the wardrobe to supply the wedding party's clothing. The king sent jewels and gifts to Jane. The event, held the 25th of May, 1553, was a triple ceremony. Lady Jane Grey, daughter of the Duke and Duchess of Suffolk, to Lord Guilford Dudley, son of the Duke and Duchess of Northumberland, Lady Catherine Dudley, daughter of the Duke and Duchess of Northumberland, to Lord Henry Hastings, daughter of the Earl and Countess of Huntington, Lady Catherine Grey, daughter of the Duke and Duchess of Suffolk, to Lord Henry Herbert, son of the Earl and Countess of Pembroke. These marriages were intended to knit together powerful families that would now be prepared to support Edward's choice to put Jane on the throne. Edward believed Mary's succession would destroy the true church and send his subjects to hell. Edward might have had some desire to leave the throne to his sister Elizabeth, but if he excluded Mary because she was illegitimate, he would have to exclude Elizabeth as well. Next should have been Francis, who was overlooked by his father. Prompted by Northumberland, Francis met with Edward and gave up her claim to the throne. This removed the last obstacle, and Edward moved forward the device for the succession. To overturn the final act of succession and his father's will, Edward drew up his succession plan. The, quote, device for the succession was a statement of Edward's desires, much as his father's will had been. 
In fact, some argue that Henry's decision to continue to create succession plans paved the way for his son to do the same thing. Edward's original version bypassed his sisters and Margaret Tudor's descendants without mention and stated that if he did not have children, the crown would pass to the, quote, heirs male of Lady Frances, then to the heirs male of Lady Jane, Lady Catherine, and Lady Mary. But soon it became clear that Edward would not live long enough for any heirs male to appear. So he made a change. If there were no ales mare to Lady Frances, the crown would pass not immediately to Lady Jane's heirs, but to Lady Jane and her heirs male. The insertion of and her meant Lady Jane Grey was named heir to the throne. Northumberland had succeeded. Jane Grey, now Jane Dudley, would inherit the throne and she would make her husband king. And as they were both young and inexperienced, he would continue his role as power behind the throne. There were some problems, of course, the most immediate being that the device might not be legal. The Third Succession Act was passed by Parliament, and therefore the law of the land. This possibility infuriated Edward, and he demanded that his council obey his will and support his device. This posed a challenge for members of the council. They were loyal to the king, and loyal to the law. But they agreed to the king's will and signed the device. Jane would be queen. It's not exactly clear when Jane learned of the plan. Some things she didn't hear until the king was already dead. However, Jane's later description of the event stated that Northumberland told her that, quote, when God would be pleased to call the king to his mercy, not remaining any hope of saving his life, I had immediately to proceed to the tower as I had been made by his majesty heir to the crown, End quote. Jane was devastated. She had been forced to marry against her will, and now she learned she'd been made the king's heir. Rumors of the king's death began to spread. Northumberland summoned Mary and Elizabeth to court. Mary was wary, but sent out from Hunston. Elizabeth said she was too ill to travel and stayed put. To respond to the rumors the king was already dead, Northumberland had the king appear at a window. However, he looked so ill that people realized he was dying. King Edward VI died on the 6th of July, 1553. His death was kept secret for a few days while everything was put into place. And then, on the 10th of July, 1553, Lady Jane Grey was proclaimed Queen of England. Two women, Jane and Mary, were headstrong and bold in a time when women were supposed to be quiet and conforming. They both stood up to challenges to their faith, no matter the consequences. They were committed to their beliefs, and they would do all they could to promote them. And they were about to face off for the crown of England. The Proclamation Jane Grey Dudley was officially proclaimed Queen of England on the 10th of July. Jane's proclamation as queen was remarkable in many ways. For one thing, A woman had never been officially proclaimed Queen of England before. Northumberland had moved Jane into the tower, the symbol of power and royal authority. She held the tower, so she held London, and that meant she held the powers of the kingdom. Or so the thinking went. But a woman? It was something Henry VII, Henry VIII, and Edward VI had all tried to avoid. In all the conflicts of the Wars of the Roses and usurpations of the crown and Richard II being deposed, there had never been a queen in charge. Way back in Matilda's day, she had been in Anjou when her father died, and it was a few years before she made a serious claim to the throne. Now, a woman was officially declared queen right in London. It was also the first time the proclamation was so long. Typically, A royal proclamation would be an official statement of what people already knew. For example, when Edward VI was proclaimed king, the proclamation was short and straightforward. Henry VIII was dead. Edward was now king. Everyone must support him. God save the king. But Jane's proclamation was different. First, it mentions Jane briefly, but then goes on at some length to explain that Mary and Elizabeth would not inherit the crown because they were both illegitimate and they might marry out of the realm. It then describes the unsullied reputation and inheritance of Francis and Eleanor Brandon's children. Finally, it specifies that Jane is the queen, and that she will maintain God's will and the laws of the land, and that the people are required to support her. 
it goes on for nearly three pages of small, tightly written text. And then, God save the Queen. Another way this proclamation stands out is that Northumberland and the council had several copies printed. They were distributed and posted all over London. This was the first time a printed document was used to proclaim the monarch. This ensured that people all over the city, and eventually further through the country, would get the message as intended. The proclamation of a new monarch was typically received with rejoicing. The descriptions of Jane's proclamation report that people did not rejoice. They were stunned and upset. The one thing Northumberland and Edward had completely ignored was the enormous popularity Mary enjoyed among the people of England. Mary. From her birth in 1516, Mary had been popular with the people. After her mother's death, Mary had worked her way back into her father's favor by agreeing to the terms of his divorce and his new religion. The country expected Mary to be the queen. They were not willing to accept Jane Grey instead. I don't think it was really a personal rejection of Grey, of Jane. Most people didn't even really know her. Jane herself hadn't thought she would be the next queen. How could anyone else have imagined it? Much of the people's dissatisfaction focused on Northumberland. It was always easier to blame the king's advisors than the king himself. Just as people had blamed Northumberland's father, Edmund Dudley, for the unpopular moves during the reign of, Hedward, of Henry the Seventh, many blamed Northumberland for the harshest penalties of the Restoration, for the efficiency with which he put down rebellions, and now for the disruption of the expected succession. Northumberland had summoned Mary to court shortly before the king's death, but Mary had been tipped off by her supporters and instead traveled to her large holdings in East Anglia. On the same day that Mary was pro that Jane was proclaimed queen, Mary sent a letter to the council asserting that, according to law, she was now queen of England. She required the obedience and loyalty of council members. Why had anyone thought Mary would back down, especially Northumberland? He had battled with Mary for years over her religious practices, and she had never backed down. Mary had been brought up by Catherine of Aragon, someone who believed in a woman's ability to rule. Mary's grandmother, Isabella of Castile, was an example of a woman who had ruled successfully. Mary knew her place, and she claimed it. Northumberland had completely underestimated her. Northumberland had underestimated Jane as well. He expected Jane to name her husband king, and then that the young couple would allow him to steer the government as he had for Edward. After all, Jane and Guilford were about the same age as Edward, and they had received much less training and preparation for rule. Huh, but Jane didn't see it that way. She refused to make her husband king. Guilford was furious, and so were his parents. But Jane remained firm. She hadn't sought the crown, but now it was hers, and she intended to rule. Both Jane and Mary claimed to be the rightful queen, but there was room for just one on the throne. Who was really queen? The people speak. On the 10th of July, and for the next few days, Jane was in the position of power. She held the tower, the greatest fortress in the land. She commanded the royal armory. She had the weapons to defend herself. The council was on her side. She had officially been proclaimed queen. Northumberland was one of the greatest and most strategic warriors in the country. Mary, on the other hand, had a few local supporters. She was popular, but she didn't have access to the troops and weapons she would need to take the throne. Even her stalwart supporters abroad, including Charles V, initially assumed that Jane would prevail, and they refrained from publicly supporting Mary. But by July 14th, it was clear that Mary was, in fact, a force to be reckoned with. Supporters were continuing to flock to her. She had moved her troops for, to the stronghold of Fram, Framlingham Castle, the strongest castle in Suffolk. Mary's claim to the throne quickly spread through the area. Men continued to come to support her. Nobles began to switch sides from Jane to Mary because their men pledged loyalty to Mary as the true queen. Recognizing the threat, Jane ordered Northumberland to go out and capture Mary. Once Northumberland left the tower, 
support of the council, and others in London began to dissolve. Word reached Jane and the council that the fleet Northumberland had ordered to Yarmouth had mutinied and were now supporting Mary. Mary's popularity was growing while Jane's was not. Jane continued to send out letters to nobles throughout the land, commanding their support and signing them, Jane the Queen. Realizing that some in the council were beginning to drift from her side, she ordered all the doors of the tower locked and that the keys be delivered directly to her. In just a few days, the tower had changed from being a stronghold of support to a prison to keep people around her. Popular sentiment continued to grow for Mary, and Jane's supporters successfully made their escape. Jane sent another letter to Surrey, calling for her loyal subjects to uphold her claim and her kingdom against the slanderous claims against her royal dignity. She was doing all she could to maintain her hold on the crown, but it was not enough. It was becoming clear that Jane's reign was about to collapse. The members of the council still in the tower began to leave. As the 18th of July dawned, Jane was left with only her parents, her husband, her mother-in-law, and her ladies around her in the tower. Members of the council met the 19th of July in Baynard's Castle and signed a proclamation that Mary was indeed Queen of England. They reached out to the imperial ambassadors to tell them they were ready to admit their mistake and proclaim Mary the Queen. The tide had turned, and the council, who had so recently compelled Jane to take the crown, turned with it. The Earl of Pembroke read the proclamation that, quote, Our sovereign lady, Queen Mary, to be just and lawfully in possession of the imperial crown of this realm. When people heard Mary's name, they broke out in cheers. That evening, Jane's father entered the room where she sat. He removed the canopy of state under which Jane was sitting and told her she must, quote, put off your royal robes. She calmly replied, quote, I much more willingly much more willingly put them off than I put them on. Jane's reign was over, but was she ever really queen? Mary, now firmly in power, said no. Jane was a usurper. All those documents Jane had signed, Jane the Queen, were physically amended to read, Jane not the Queen. Of course, it wasn't Mary's best interest to say she had been queen all along. The question of Jane's legal claim is still debated. Henry VIII had made numerous changes to the succession, daughters out, daughters in, and his will had been made law. But that's a difference. Parliament passed the acts of succession. Parliament did not pass Edward's device for the succession. Was it legal? How much power did the king have to choose his successor? It was still a bit of an open question in Tudor times. Ultimately, the thing that put Mary on the throne was the will of the people. They rallied to her, they changed sides, they took up arms. In the face of all of Northumberland's planning and securing the tower and men and ships and weapons, the will of the people turned the tide. The people demanded that Mary be queen. They prevailed. So, what do you think? Was Jane Grey Dudley really Queen of England? I'd love to hear from you. Thank you all who have sent questions for us to explore this month. Please send more and join us next month as we take a look at some famous love stories of history and literature. What better way to celebrate Valentine's Month? Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed today's podcast, please share with a friend. Do send any questions or comments. I'd love to hear from you where we should explore next. And please subscribe and leave a review. I'd really appreciate it. I'm so glad we could explore history together. Till next time.